focused ultrasound. Um, it's kind of a uh, traveling back to uh, the way things had been done before, but I hope I'll be able to convince you that um, lesioning has a very uh, valid role in the treatment of movement disorders. So um, these are my disclosures here. And um, just to, going back to talk a little bit about essential tremor, I know most everybody here has a pretty good understanding of it, but it's a very common neurologic disorder, the most common movement disorder. 4% uh, of patients, people over age 40 have this, and approximately 10 million Americans. Um, it is a postural, excuse me, a, a postural and or kinetic tremor. Uh, it has a frequency of 4 to 12 hertz, tends to be higher frequency in the young and lower frequency as we get older. It's an inherited disorder, uh, autosomal dominant, and there are some environmental factors that may be at play as well. Um, the disability related to essential tremor is significant and I think uh, underestimated by even uh, our own community. Um, looking at a population-based study, 75% uh, of patients were untreated and even undiagnosed and still reported disability after they were found. 90% um, of patients who are treated report disability. 25% uh, of the patients uh, are forced to quit their profession, and 60% uh, it affects their prof profession and in uh, pretty profound ways where they may not apply for um, uh, new positions or promotions. Uh, there are basically two main drugs that can be helpful in this condition. Uh, with uh, level A established efficacy. As you know, that's primidone and propanolol. And this is kind of the treatment algorithm that we typically use. Uh, after the diagnosis is made, patients are put on either primidone or propanolol uh, or a combination of the above. And if that doesn't work, uh, then they're selected for uh, intervention. And historically, that was uh, thalamotomy with radiofrequency. Uh, more in the more modern era, that's DBS uh, or Gamma Knife, uh, and uh, I'm not going to talk about those guys at all today. But instead, a new therapy called MR-guided focused ultrasound. Um, so, focused ultrasound has been around for a long time. Uh, it was really, really uh, William Fry and Francis Fry in the 50s that first uh, showed that you can use multiple transducers of ultrasound to uh, basically lesion deep areas of the brain. They looked at a monkey brain and showed that with uh, four transducers you could create a lesion uh, in the basal ganglia of a, of a monkey, um, but they really had to remove the skull to be able to get enough energy down to the target area. Uh, it wasn't until the 1990s when uh, technological advancement allowed for many, many more transducers to be able to use and in a phased array fashion so that we could overcome the energy absorption and reflection of the skull and actually deliver a thermal lesion uh, deep down below the surface of the brain without removing any skull. Um, that combined with MRI thermography, which is also developed in the 90s, really allowed the treatment that we have today. Uh, MRI thermography basically allows us to look in one plane in near real time uh, in the MRI suite what the temperature of a slice is uh, with very high degree of accuracy, both in terms of anatomy and in terms of uh, thermal um, uh, levels. So that is all put together in a device called Exablate Neuro by Insightech. And the, the major concepts with this are that uh, we can basically use MR images that are obtained right at the time of treatment or very shortly before uh, so there's no potential movement related to uh, doing a scan and then doing a co-registration with it. Uh, there are significant safety features involved, so if there's any movement that occurs during the treatment, it's detected, or if there's any cavitation that might occur, uh, that is uh, uh, stops therapy. Uh, again, there's real-time temperature feedback, and this is an iterative procedure, so we can basically create the lesion and do testing in a, in a uh, closed-loop fashion. Uh, the potential benefits of this are really uh, reduced risk in, in that we don't have to go through any other tissue 
uh, in order to get to our target tissue. Uh, there should be, uh, and so far the, the data bears out that there is a lower bleeding risk and um, infection risk. Um, and there are, you know, there's no general anesthesia involved um, and the very fast recovery. Um, it's it's not clear that there's Im improved outcomes yet, but I think that um, without any kind of tissue displacement due to uh, opening the skull and then introducing air or uh, draining CSF, there's a uh, potential for improved accuracy. Um, and we can really limit the effects to just the, leap, the uh, uh, treatment area rather than any uh, path that might be injured along the way. Uh, there's also an ability to really sculpt a lesion in a three-dimensional fashion the way we, in a way that we don't have with DBS right now, uh, where we can create multiple overlapping lesions to create a three-dimensional uh, lesion. So just want to go through the workflow a little bit. Um, basically, there's four main steps. We bring in the patient to the ultrasound machine uh, and uh, MRI suite with a CRW frame attached. Uh, hook them up and there's a bath that, that cools the scalp. Their patients have to be shaved completely. Uh, we then go to planning where we'll obtain diagnostic imaging and we'll verify that our thermal lesioning is in fact in the area that we expect it to be with very low temperature thermal uh, uh, rises. And then we'll deliver a pre-lethal dose of energy which will uh, shut down the active cells in the area that we're creating the thermal uh, response, both to look for side effect profiles and to look for treatment efficacy before we deliver a final lesion. And you can see here, this is kind of a time temperature map, and uh, you can see that basically before about uh, 56 degrees, there's uh, no immediate damage. And so this is the area between about 40 and 50 degrees where we're heating the tissue in the area of the VIM nucleus to try to look for uh, inactivation of uh, the function of that area without creating a lesion. And then basically, uh, once you're above 56 degrees Celsius, you're pretty much creating a permanent lesion uh, immediately. There is a kind of a gray zone in between in the high 40s, low 50s, where if you spend enough time in that temperature range, you can uh, create permanent injury. Uh, one of the great uh, aspects of this technology is that it is uh, significantly more accurate than gamma knife uh, in terms of the dose drop off of the energy in the treatment. So if you look, this is a rabbit model uh, where they're uh, creating a lesion and this is 100 uh, micrometers and you can see that within about 100 micrometers you're going from treated area with necrosis to untreated area where there's essentially uh, no damage at all. So the, the energy drop-off is really quite remarkable, and that's really due to the, you know, the fact that there's essentially a thousand elements that are all delivering ultrasound uh, from different angles and all crossing in this very precise uh, point deep in the brain. So from a clinical standpoint, this technology was first utilized and verified in a pilot study uh, done at University of Virginia with Jeff Elias um, and colleagues. Um, and this was utilizing this uh, same device. Um, and basically, they looked at 15 patients with a central tremor. Uh, this was a um, uh, not randomized. Uh, there was no sham control arm. But it did show that there was about a 75% reduction in tremor on the treated side. Um, and there were a number of side effects that were thought to be relatively mild. There was uh, some paresthesias and one patient who had an unpleasant dysesthesia in the finger that persisted uh, out for a year. And you can see the individual patients here that were involved in that trial. You can tell, you can see that after you know, one week, one month, three months, one year, there was a very significant decline in the CRST. This is a clinical rating score for tremor, which was utilized both for the uh, pilot study and for our uh, pivotal study. Uh, you can see that there were a couple of patients where there was some wearing off of the uh, effect, but in many patients, this was very durable out to a year. Looking at the uh, lesion itself, um, you can see this readily on T1 as well as flare imaging at post-up day one, post-up day seven, um, but it tends to uh, shrink over time after that. You can see here, this is the uh, 
there, we kind of break it down into three different zones. The zone one is this kind of necrotic area. Zone two is a kind of a penumbral area right around the edge where it's not clear where the, this tissue is viable. And then there's an area of essentially edema that is thought to be uh, going to recover and not be lesioned uh, in the long run. If you look at the, um, the, um, the volume of tissue involved in the lesion over time, you can see that after one week, you have the maximal lesion size of about eight and a half millimeters. But over time, it shrinks. And by three months, it's uh, barely visible at all, less than one millimeter. And it's unclear whether or not um, you know, there's a tissue that is basically filling in a necrotic lesion or whether there's some uh, recovery that's uh, occurring as well. So uh, that, that success with the pilot study led to a pivotal design uh, study with uh, eight centers and 76 patients, again, using the CRST as a primary outcome score. Uh, and we chose the three-month uh, time frame because there was a sham arm involved. Uh, there was a three-to-one randomization between treatment and sham. Uh, and after the three months of the blinded uh, study, they w then went into an open label, and patients who received sham tre treatment could then come back for the, uh, the actual real treatment, uh, although they had to undergo the procedure twice uh, for those patients. The primary efficacy was utilizing Part A and Part B of the CRST uh, rating scale, and that basically looked at rest tremor, uh, action tremor, postural tremor, and then some activities including spiral writing, straight lines, and pouring. Uh, there was also secondary endpoints for disability and then self-reported quality of life as well, uh, as well as looking at uh, side effect profile. Uh, the outcomes were videotaped for the CRST score and then uh, analyzed by blinded uh, neurologists who were not involved in any of the centers uh, that were providing the treatments. So here you can see kind of the breakdown of the different arms. There were 56 patients uh, enrolled in the treatment arm, 20 patients in the sham. Uh, once you're on the table, uh, you are part of the uh, intention to treat analysis. So whatever happens after that, um, you're counted in that uh, group. So there were a couple of patients in the treatment arm that, had, that never made it uh, to the uh, three-month or 12-month outcome, uh, but they still had to be uh, considered wherever they were with their tremor score. Um, 54 patients uh, completed the treatment protocol uh, for the, for the uh, treatment group and uh, 20 for the sham. And again, the patient, 19 of the 20 patients who were given the sham treatment were then uh, chose to cross over to have the actual treatment. Uh, looking at the demographics, you can see that they're essentially very similar between uh, the two groups. Uh, for the inclusion criteria, you had to have the diagnosis of a central tremor made by a movement disorder neurologist. You had to be refractory to two medications. You had to have no changes in your med medications for 30 days beforehand. Uh, you had to have a, a fairly significant tremor indicated by a CRST score uh, of your postural or intention tremor of greater than two uh, and a disability score greater than two. Uh, and then as we got through the trial, very early we found out that skull density uh, had a large outcome in whether or not we could deliver enough energy to the target area. So that became a, a inclusion criteria uh, as well that uh, we developed a, a ratio that basically was a measure of how um, distorted the skull uh, was in terms of creating scatter for the ultrasound. People who had very significant uh, trabeculae in the medullary cortex scattered much more, or if it was very thick, it would, it would um, absorb more energy, and those patients had to be excluded. Uh, here's the, the primary outcome measure at three months. Uh, this is a uh, percent improvement in the overall CRST score for Part A and Part B. This is not a uh, percentage of tremor decline. So uh, there was about 47% improvement in the uh, treatment group and essentially a 0% improvement in the sham group. This was very significant both in terms of looking at baseline for the treatment group and in terms of uh, comparing between the two groups. Uh, and the, the patients who were in the sham arm and then went back and had treatment also had a very significant uh, improvement in their overall score. 
Um, if we look at the disability scores, which is really looking at activities of daily living, there was also a very significant improvement. There was a, about a 70% improvement uh, in disability at three months afterwards, and this was fairly well sustained at 12 months. Um, and it was, there was a relatively good safety profile. There were uh, 210 adverse events collected in the 76 patients over the year, um, and all but uh, one, one of them was considered mild or moderate. There were two significant adverse events that were collected during the trial. One was a stroke that uh, happened in a patient six weeks after their treatment on the opposite side of the brain and was thought to be unrelated to the treatment. Um, another was a persistent numbness and tingling that was uh, considered to be uh, unpleasant enough to be considered a serious adverse event. Uh, if we look at the most uh, frequent adverse events, it really is numbness, tingling, headache, nausea, vomiting. Most of these were really related to either the treatment itself at the time. So there were a number of people who got very dizzy or even nauseated lying in the scanner um, and frequently felt like they were kind of falling over backwards during the actual sonication. Um, almost all of these uh, resolved over time. But if we look at uh, 12 months after treatment, uh, there were a number of patients, eight who had paresthesias persist. Uh, we had a couple that had taste disturbances. There were five patients that had gait difficulties, either subjective or objective, and uh, dysmetria, uh, one patient with weakness and one patient with vertigo. So then if we look at the um, just the Part A score, which is the postural or intention tremor, and we look at both the treatment group as well as the crossover group that was the sham that then crossed over, uh, we can see that, again, there was a very significant improvement in that tremor. That's kind of a, a more traditional look at percent of tremor improved, and it was about 70% for the treatment arm, uh, and even better than that for the crossover arm. Uh, it's not clear why the crossover arm, it wasn't statistically improved, but there was a trend towards improvement in the crossover arm. So uh, there were a number of kind of treatment considerations that, that go into this. Uh, there are three patients who uh, were enrolled and went through the procedure but did not, uh, could not finish it for one reason or another, skull density or uh, kind of ability to stay in the scanner for four hours. Uh, this is a, a pretty tough treatment for people who have back pain, uh, people who have claustrophobia, uh, is certainly not for everybody. Um, the skull characteristics, as I said, did affect the outcome in a couple of people. Um, and, and patients do have to have their hair shaved uh, in order to have the treatment, which is probably going to be uh, a pretty significant factor for a number uh, of patients. But uh, in conclusion, it uh, was shown to be safe and effective. Um, I, I personally kind of put it in the, somewhere in the continuum between deep brain stimulation and gamma knife for a central tremor. It has a lot of the benefits of DBS in that we are able to interact with the patient and really precisely um, target where we're placing the therapy, look for side effects, and look for efficacy before actually delivering the final therapy. Uh, and yet it shares some of the benefits of something like Gamma Knife, where it is a one-time treatment. Uh, there's no you know, significant number of follow-up visits necessary. There's no implanted hardware. There are no battery replacements. Um, and so for a lot of patients, uh, you know, it, there's, no, there's no penetration of the skull that has to happen. I wouldn't say it's non-invasive because there are definitely significant inter energy going into the brain, but it is non-incisional, which is a fairly big thing uh, for a lot of patients. We, we generally don't see the patients who will never have DBS because uh, they never get to us. And, and being part of this trial kind of let me realize that there really are quite a few patients who we will never see unless we have therapies like this available. Um, and again, this is the first, it is now FDA approved um, for a couple months now. It does not have a coverage policy by Medicare yet, so um, we have not really treated patients uh, in a commercial sense yet, but, we're, but there is a high level of interest in the community. It is the first indication for uh, MR-guided focused ultrasound in the brain. Uh, mostly it was chosen because it was such a um, 
uh, nice target to be able to access using the device, uh, the Exablate 4000, but there are a number of other indications that are being pursued, including obsessive, de uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, epilepsy, and uh, pain, and these are done, being actively pursued in other countries now, and just uh, now protocols are being designed here in the U.S. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ryder, very much. Yep.